I weighed 297 pounds and I'm six foot three inches and I was pre-diabetic and I was miserable. I had joint pain. I had dandruff. I had severe reflux. I had uh, just chronically pissed off about everything in the world. Uh, not, not, not a formal anxiety disorder or any of that, but just chronic frustration with everything in my life because I was miserable. I was here. I was this doctor who was supposed to help other people with their health and I couldn't fix my own health. And so I read uh, Atkins diet revolution. I read primal blueprint by Mark Sisson. I read the paleo diet by Lauren Cordain and all those made a lot of sense to me. And so I started to really cut the carbohydrates out of my diet. And it was when I got below probably 50 total grams a day that I started to lose weight, lose fat, and, and started to reverse my type 2 diabetes. I had to cut it down to 20 total grams after I stalled out for a while, and that restarted the, the, the fat loss and improved my A1C even more. And then, so keto helped my severe heartburn. Uh, I used to take two Nexium every day for my heartburn, and it got 80% better on keto. And I kept seeing this uh, a friend of mine now, but then I didn't know who he was, Sean Baker, talking about this carnivore diet. And at the end of that month, I noticed that I'd, I'd lost four or five more pounds where I thought I had reached what I was going to get. Uh, and my heartburn was gone. So now I'm, I'm like three and a half years, going on four years carnivore. And I've yet to find a reason that I need to add plants back into my diet. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm an open-minded, all-inclusive carnivore. If, if people want to eat some plants, I'm, I, I don't believe that plants are trying to kill you. I do believe plants are trying to defend themselves and defend their seeds. I, that's 100% true, but I don't think they're out to kill you. And I think many people can tolerate certain plants uh, in, in pretty large amounts and do just great. But every time I try to experiment and add plants back in, I start to get abdominal bloating. I start to gain fat and I start to just not feel as good as I currently feel on a carnivore diet. And so I cut them back out. So I don't work out in a gym with, with weight equipment. I, I have a 40 acre farm here in Midwestern Tennessee. And so I work out on the farm, just basically doing farmer and rancher chores. Uh, Nisha inherited a farm from her grandfather who went to heaven and so we were like you know what let's get the heck out of the city let's go back to the country and so 40 acres and currently we have sheep we have turkey and chicken and quail and dogs and cats and I'm, in, I'm contemplating getting a, a few head of cattle and maybe a couple of pigs all my mornings are filled with research yeah. Uh, researching not only nutrition and medicine, but also archaeology, paleoanthropology, because many of the the things that we in the carnivore community have have found to be true in our personal life, when you start really digging into archaeology, but even more importantly, paleoanthropology, you find out that human beings have been super carnivores for over two and a half million years. About 12,000 years ago, something catastrophic happened and we were no longer able to have access to these humongous fatty animals that we had hunted for millions of years and so we had to we didn't get to it wasn't like it was an innovation or a discovery we had to start farming plants grains and beans and and stuff like that because we could, we didn't have access to the megafauna so we had to do that or we'd start to death and a lot of people don't realize that even in North America, before 15,000 years ago, there were camels, there were horses, there were multiple species of bison and buffalo, there were armadillo the size of Volkswagens, like there was, there was all these huge megafauna just roaming around, eating the grass and eating the vegetation. And in many cases, it didn't take a lot of brain work on our part to, to hunt them uh, through endurance hunting until they were exhausted because animals like that, they can't run at full speed while they're panting. All these people who advocate a plant-based diet, they are, uh, people need to understand, they are earnest. They're honest. They believe what they're saying. They're not trying to trick you. Now, they may have investments in, uh, you know, plant-based companies, and they may stand to gain financially from that, but I don't think this is some big conspiracy. Most doctors get very little training in human nutrition, Right, we're all aware of that, but but they get zero training in archaeology, 
and paleoanthropology. And I, I found my nutrition, kind of my global circumspect understanding of nutrition, very deficient until I discovered the paleopathology and paleoanthropology and, and that huge volume of research literature. And when I started delving into that, it became quickly apparent that we're, we are super carnivores. The majority of our diet each and every day needs to be fatty meat and eggs with the yolk. That, that's what we basically became homo sapiens sapien eating. That's what gave us access to the omega-3 fatty acids like DHA and EPA, not ALA, because many of us are very poor converters of ALA into DHA. And you, can't, you basically, you can't grow an optimal human brain without access to DHA, both while the mother, uh, uh, before she's pregnant, while she's pregnant, while she's breastfeeding, and then when the child is, is an infant, is young, if they don't have adequate source, uh, sources of DHA in that entire span, you're gonna wind up with someone with a lower IQ as if that baby had access to DHA their entire existence, even before they were born. Humans have to have DHA in our diet. It is essential. And some of us can convert ALA, which is alpha-linoleic acid that is found in plants. We can convert that if we're eating pounds of that food a day. We can convert enough of that into DHA and EPA to limp by. But it's, it's known in physiological research that many humans are very poor converters of ALA into EPA and DHA. And so with that knowledge, then you, 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 you can tell somebody, well, I guess you can eat, you know, five pounds of greens a day and two pounds of nuts a day with all of the carbs that come with that and all of the, the anti-nutrients, all the, the lectins and phytates and oxalates uh, and all the inflammation they potentially cause, or you can just eat the yolks of eggs that are pastured, you can, and you can definitely get it from seafood. That's probably the richest source. But many, many animal sources, including organ meats, the brain, the liver, spleen, and others, uh, along with the yolks of pastured eggs, you're going to get plenty of DHA. So I get probably the majority of the DHA I get is from cod liver, not cod liver oil. But uh, I love to eat cod liver. I enjoy the taste. And uh, also sardines with the bones in and the skin on. Uh, then pastured egg yolks. We have about 30 hens running around in the backyard eating bugs and worms and seeds and turning that into nutritious egg yolks for us. Uh, and then as far as my diet, I typically get up and I'll have a morning cup of coffee with some pastured butter in it. And uh, after maybe one or two of those, I go get started in do, doing my farm chores, and sometimes I, that won't stop until 4 or 5 or 6 p.m., and that's typically when I break my fast, and mm -hmm. I'll eat my, and some days I'll eat one meal a day, and it's typically two and a half pounds of ground beef, a can or two of cod liver, or a can or two of sardines. There's quite a bit of evidence that uh, at least certain tribes of humans would be geographically uh, trapped where there, where there was no megafauna. And so they made very large advantage with seafood. And then they finally figured out, no, they were just eating the hell out of mollusks and, and crustaceans and they were piling the shells up. And so that was basically a huge garbage pile of, of mussel shells and oyster shells. So I think there, I think it, there may be subpopulations within the human species currently who would do better with a seafood-based carnivore diet mm -hmm. or a seafood-based keto diet or even just a seafood-based low-carb diet. I think uh, some of us might do better with that, whereas others of us would do better with a more ruminant-based, land-based uh, mammal diet. Fish equals meat, for those of you who are confused. Anything that swims, creeps, crawls, flies, runs, slithers, all that stuff is, is game on a carnivore diet. And uh, indeed, there are many vegetarians in the world who, for ethical or religious reasons, limit the amount of, of meat. They don't want to eat ruminant meat. And I think that they can get the, 
almost everything they need mm. from seafood if they eat a, a very you know variety of seafood and then egg yolks and then plus or minus some butter and ghee or some cheese there are many many things that we currently don't know when it comes to human nutrition let's all keep an open mind if somebody wants to experiment with something i love that i love it when somebody says you know what i'm not feeling great on this that or the other i'm going to try this 100 percent, do a 30-day or 90-day trial of that but all of us need to find the find where we fall on the proper human diet spectrum where we experience our best health at this moment in time and that's where you need to stick and for many of us that's carnivore some of us that's ketovore some that's keto some it's low carb with lots of healthy animal fat and protein whatever works best for you i'm 100 percent for that because as a doctor my goal for you is optimal health. That's what I want you to have. And, and I'm not in any way advocating it's either this way or the highway. Let's all keep experimenting. It seems that I don't know why they, they get so emotionally evolved, involved in the argument. I understand that many people eat a vegan diet for ethical reasons or religious reasons, but nutrition is science. Nutrition is physiology. Either you're eating all of the nutrients that you need yeah. or you're not and you're having to take a handful of supplements every day if you even hope to achieve optimal health. I, well, maybe not a regular basis, but I think we all should experiment with organs. I think we should all try them. Uh, de for, for example, liver. There, there are a, a large assortment of livers that you can try. And so uh, the liver from an adult cow is very livery, very coppery, very metallic. I mean, it has a distinct taste and some people abhor. But now if you make chicken liver uh, using Nisha's chicken nugget recipe that has a carnivore breading of pork panko and Parmesan cheese, if you cook chicken livers like that, I can eat a bunch of chicken liver, right? And the same cod liver packed in its own oil is very mild and is a just a literal superfood multivitamin and mineral and i can eat that all day i don't have any problem with that but you know and so sheep's liver is is very mild i can eat that and i actually enjoy it i think that our ancestors it's pretty clear were big fans of organ meats and not only did they eat them to keep from starving to death they ate them because they actually enjoyed them so even back in the early 1910s, 20s, and 30s, if you looked at a restaurant menu, it was full of organ meats and different ways to cook it. Uh, people at home cooked organs routinely. Uh, up until the 60s, it was pretty much considered mandatory to have liver and onions at least once a week. And I think the once a week guideline, that probably is a pretty darn good thumbnail rule to have organ meats of some kind. And I think uh, there are definitely carnivores who haven't touched an uh, organ meat in 20 years. They look like they're doing great, but I'm not convinced that all of us mm -hmm. can eat just the muscle meat and fat of, of mammals and do fine without including organs once a, me once a week, once a month. Find an organ that you can eat and enjoy and have it once a week. It's not a big deal. That way out of a, an abundance of caution, if there is something that you're missing in your just your your muscle and fat diet, you're going to get it from that once a week organ meat. On my, I have a patron on my Patreon who is from Norway, and so he loves cod liver, and he's given me all these recipes about how to cook it. But uh, so cod liver is very smushy, and so what I do is I dump it out into a bowl. I put a lot of zero carb mustard on it. And then I just basically smush that up until it, and so it turns out to be a very thick mustard. And I usually put that on my, my ground beef or my steak. And so uh, the cod liver becomes a condiment. And when you mix it with mustard or any kind of vinegar base, you, I can't taste the, the, the liver at all. And so when you look on pubmed.gov, which any human with a computer can search and research, and I look for vitamin A toxicity. I find it in supplements, definitely. There's multiple case reports of someone who was taking too much vitamin A as a supplement. I find polar bear toxicity reported in the historical literature. If you eat too much polar bear liver, you definitely yeah. will develop vitamin A toxicity. But I cannot find a single study 
a single case report of anyone developing vitamin A toxicity from eating beef's liver, sheep's liver, goat's liver, chicken liver, cod liver. There, it, it's just not in the literature. Cod liver, any other fish liver, except now there are a couple of fish that are that people eat in Japan, that their livers are very toxic, and so you shouldn't eat those. So currently, I tell people if you're not eating polar bear liver or the the toxic liver of these two fish. I think you're pretty safe because there would be a case report if someone had eaten too much chicken liver or beef liver and developed vitamin A toxicity and such a case report does not currently exist. Vitamin A and vitamin D work in tandem. So it might be that you're taking synthetic forms of vitamin A and you're already deficient in vitamin D. So it's just magnifying this effect, right? I exactly. also found, yeah, I also found a, um, an article on cod liver oil because it's so popular and what the researchers were saying is that the newer formulations of cod liver oil for whatever reason it seems that the vitamin d is being lost um and so like the the ratio of both is being is not optimal anymore and that could be the cause why people might be having issues with cod liver oil so you have to be very careful which brands you're taking if you want to take the the oil yeah Cod liver oil, if it's put in a, a, a plastic or a glass bottle it, or even a metal canister is going to be at least to some degree oxidized and rancid by the time you put it in your mouth. First bite of solid food was when he was about four or five months old. He, was, he had a tooth and he was reaching out and grabbing food and trying to put it in his mouth. And so I was eating beef ribs and I cleaned off a of beef rib probably 95% few little remnants left and he he wanted it so I just handed it to him and he proceeded to clean that beef rib of all the connective tissue the cartilage any remaining meat he routinely eats bacon and sausage and he loves steak carnival come to town they come once a year and out of all the crap there he ate the guts out of a Philly steak and cheese sandwich and he, he didn't even ask for the cotton candy. He didn't ask for any of the junk. He just, he wanted, he's like, oh, they have steak. Yeah, I'll have that. He's probably, he's a ketivore. He, every now and then he'll have some avocado or an olive or some, you know, some fruit or berries or something. But uh, the vast majority of his food is beef and pork. That's what he, that's his jam. He was breastfed for a year and a half. What is your recommendation for breastfeeding in general? So obviously, you know, living in modern society with busy schedules, I understand and I, it, there's no judgment on my part uh, what moms do, but please try to breastfeed your child for at least 12 solid months if you can. Uh, it looks like from the archaeological and anthropological literature that, that humans probably breastfed exclusively for somewhere between three and five years. If you're eating a diet that's deficient in iodine, or vitamin D, or vitamin A, or any of the other essential things, then you're not going to have that in your breast milk. 